I am excited to introduce Madeline Keenan, who is a graduate student at the University of California, San Francisco. And she um, did her bachelor's at the University of Arizona, and she actually got um, a lit an English literature and bio molecular biology degree, which is fantastic. I love to see combinations like that. Um, and now, as I mentioned, she is working on her PhD at UCSF and she is mentored by Dr. Narlikar and um, Dr. Redding. And she has several honors, uh, very impressive. I'm only going to mention like a couple, but um, you can ask her later for her CV when she applies for jobs and postdocs later on. Um, but she actually has uh, received an F31 and the F99, which is a really cool award where you can actually transition from pre-doc to postdoc. And so that's fantastic. And she was a Genentech fellow and, UC and um, Discovery fellow at UCSF before that. And she's won um, poster presentation awards and has ha had higher honor high honors tuition scholarship. So very impressive. And I'm really excited to hear your talk today. So without any more rambling, I would love to hear um, Madeline's talk. All right. Um, thank you so much to the organizers for having me here today. I'm so excited to share this with you. Um, it's been really fun to be a part of this community. So today I'm going to tell you a story about DNA compaction by a dynamic binding protein, HP1. Um, okay, so multicellular organisms face quite the challenging task. Um, despite every cell in the human genome having the exact same genetic information, this information needs to be differentially expressed in order to achieve cell types with specialized functions. Um, so I think everyone here probably knows one of um, the primary ways that that seems to be accomplished, this differential gene expression, is through um, organization of the genome. And so this is kind of a global view of organization with heterochromatin versus euchromatin. Um, and it's an electron microscope image of a mammalian nucleus with the nuclear membrane shown here. Um, DNA is stained. DNA is stained in white. Um, and heterochromatic regions are associated with densely compacted um, DNA. So you can see that you have this large punct of DNA in this heterochromatic domain. Um, and of course, they're also associated with repressed transcription. And one other interesting um, aspect of heterochromatin is that it's very positionally stable. Uh, so if you look at this heterochromatic domain over time, um, it's not going to fluctuate all over the nucleus. It's just going to kind of stay in its position and fluctuate locally. Um, so the heterochromatic regions are in contrast, of course, to euchromatic regions. Um, and these are open and accessible in sites of active transcription. Uh, so how are you actually able to accomplish this organization? Um, a lot of people um, in a lot of labs over the year have studied this, but have found um, that one component of constitutive heterochromatin is the presence of heterochromatin protein 1 or HP1. Um, there's actually three paralogs of HP1, alpha, beta, gamma, and I'll be talking for the most part today about um, alpha and maybe a little bit about beta in the end. Um, and HP1 has a couple different domains, um, a chromoshadow domain that mediates dimerization, a chromo domain that mediates binding to specific marks in heterochromatin, as well as a few disordered regions. So um, this hinge region has a lot of charged residues that mediate binding to DNA, as well as these two disordered extensions on the tails. Um, so the question kind of is how is HP1 able to actually lead to transcriptional silencing. So if you recruit HP1 to an atopic locus, it leads to both the condensation of the underlying DNA as well as transcriptional silencing. Um, so people kind of had this dogma in the field that HP1 would clamp down on heterochromatin and compact it crazily and occlude any sort of transcriptional activator. Um, so it would be this really stable binding that would um, get rid of any association of uh, transcriptional activators. And so they tested this early on. This is Tom Stelly and a few other labs we did some FRAP experiments in cells in the early 2000s. And so this is H1 labeled with GFP, and this is the outside of the nucleus here. And you can see this heterochromatic domain is labeled with the HP1. Um, and they FRAP this HP1 region. And if it was a really stable binding protein, you'd expect it not to recover. Um, similar to like a histone protein, it would um, stay bleached for a long amount of time. However, that's not what they saw. So this bleached region turned out um, really rapidly recovered. So within a matter of seconds, you see full recovery of this heterochromatic HP1. Um, so that kind of leads to uh, the question I'm gonna be asking during my talk, which is how can you have this dynamic HP1 binding protein? Um, and is it in vitro 
sufficient to actually stably compact DNA? Um, can some of the activity we see in vivo with heterochromatic stability be accounted for just with HP1? And kind of a limitation in the field has been um, a lack of assays that actually allow you to look at compaction in real time. A lot of the assays used are more endpoints. Um, and so um, I was really lucky to join the Narlikar lab right as Adam Larson, um, a graduate student, was finishing up his PhD. And he had a really, um, really interesting discovery that HP1, um, in the presence of either a phosphorylation mark or DNA, uh, phase separates out a solution um, into two different solutions, one with a high concentration of, of um, protein and DNA, as you can see in these green drops here, and one with a low concentration. Oops. Um, so this phase separation into these droplets is actually kind of a mesoscale assay that I'm going to use to actually look at the dynamics of the protein and DNA. Um, and then the second assay I'll show you is DNA curtains. Um, so this is a single molecule technique that allows us to look at DNA condensation in real time. Um, and I will talk a little bit about that at the beginning of my talk. So first I'm gonna kind of go into um, stable compaction of HP1 alpha or of DNA by HP1 alpha and then go into kind of the dynamics. So is HP1 in vitro able to um, condense DNA stably? So, I'm gonna explain DNA curtains. Um, it's a single molecule technique that allows us to align thousands of DNA strands on a nanofabricated barrier. We use this flow cell setup and there's a glass surface that I can deposit a lipid bilayer on the surface of. Um, this is then fluid in two dimensions, so you can actually get the, the movement of these lipid species. We can then use buffer flow to push the DNA to the chrome barrier um, and then get alignment. So sorry, DNA is actually tethered to the lipid bilayer. So then we can use buffer flow to push it um, to the chrome barrier and then extend it over this chrome. And so this is the turf microscopy image of this curtain. You see the barrier here and all the DNA is extended out. It's only tethered on one end um, and buffer flow is pushing the other end over. It's at a pretty low force regime in the um, kind of in the the femtonewton range, so it's not a whole lot of force that's pushing it, but it is enough to extend the DNA out. And so um, we label DNA with an intercalating dye yo-yo-1, um, and the first experiment I did back with Adam was to um, just add HP1 and see what happened to the curtain. And so what we saw, um, this is all against buffer flow. So any changes in the DNA is due to the presence of the protein and not to any flow changes. And we saw the emergence of these puncta at the end of the DNA strand that you can see here. And then after these puncta form, we saw rapid compaction of the DNA up. And so we're using 50 kilobases of DNA. And within seconds, we see the entire compacted structure is up at the top of the barrier. Um, so HP1 is able just with electrostatic interactions and no ATP, um, condenses DNA really, really rapidly. And this is just a still image um, of this puncta formation. And we were curious what the HP1 looked like. Um, this is just the DNA stain, and we wanted to know if um, these puncta were being formed because HP1 was also being recruited to these regions. And so instead of labeling the DNA, I labeled the protein, um, and we were able to see that Indeed, we, we got HP1 um, binding along the length of the DNA strand and then forming these puncta at the end of the DNA. And then after these puncta form, they would once again rapidly compact up to the top of the barrier. And once they were compacted at the top of the barrier, they're actually pretty stable. Um, so you could flow buffer for a long amount of time and they wouldn't decompact. And it wasn't until we put these high salt buffers in, like 500 millimolar KCL that we could get them to dissociate. And so this is just a model of what I, of what I show you with the curtains. Um, we have this free end of DNA that actually has less tension on it um, because of the buffer flow and um, there's less kind of strain from the, the DNA upstream that the DNA down here has um, kind of more tension from the DNA downstream, excuse me. Um, and so this end, free end of the DNA is able to fluctuate more. Um, HP1 comes and binds along the length of the DNA strand. And then we think it's able to actually kind of um, utilize these natural DNA fluctuations and bridge adjacent sites to get this condensation at the end. And we get this punctive formation of both HP1 and DNA. And then at this point, we're not sure exactly what's happening, but we think there's some sort of tethering of individual HP1 molecules um, where HP1 in the puncta is able to associate with this um, DNA um, upstream and facilitate the condensation up into a compacted structure. <clears throat> 
So something we were really curious about, we see these, these compacted puncta, and we wanted to know how much force was actually um, this, this, these puncta were resistant to. Um, were they stable structures? Would they just slide right off? What was gonna happen if we actually pulled on it? Um, and so that's what we decided to do. Um, we wanted to ask if we pulled on these puncta, how easily would they come apart? And to do this, I worked in collaboration with Lucy Brennan, who's a postdoc in both Sci Reading and Boston Mall Studies Lab. And we used an optical trap setup. Um, so we have um, two stripped out of beads that are um, in, trapped in highly focused lasers. Um, we have one here and one here, and it's tethered, DNA is tethered on either end to these beads. We then add in HP1 alpha that's labeled with um, a fluorescent marker. Um, and instead of seeing the puncta form at the end of DNA where there, there's the, the lowest amount of tension and the most fluctuations, we actually see it in the middle because it's the puncta in the middle because it's tethered on both ends this time. We can then move this polystyrene bead to the right and get an idea of the amount of force that's actually being kept within these puncta. And we were really lucky we did these experiments um, on a Lomex um, trap that actually has um, confocal laser as well. So we could visualize the, the compaction um, of this puncta at the same time that we we're utilizing the optical trap setup. And so here you can see the confocal image. We have two beads with the um, compacted puncta in the center. And so this is HP1 label this time, um, no DNA label. Um, and then we're gonna pull this um, right hand bead until we reach 40 picanewtons of force. And we thought at some particular force that we would get dissociation of the puncta and we'd be able to get an idea of how stable they were. Um, 40 picanewtons, just to give you a little bit of insight, um, if you go much further, you're gonna start to melt the base pairs in B form DNA. So you can't go too much further than 40 picanewtons um, without coming back. And so um, we pulled the DNA up to this 40 picanewtons, but we still saw the compacted puncta. Um, we weren't able to dissociate it um, at that 40 picanewtons of force. And that was kind of really surprising to us um, and led us to kind of question how much DNA is actually being sequestered in these puncta. Um, we know that this is HP1 labeled, but if, if we're reaching this full 40 picanewtons, we, we suspected that there had to be some sort of DNA um, being um, compacted and condensed in there. And so we looked at the force extension curve. Uh, so this is extension versus force. And this black line is DNA alone. Um, and you can see near is the warm-like chain model. You, um, the DNA is slack, and as you're pulling it, you're not experiencing much force. But once you get to these longer, longer lengths, you start to um, feel more and more and more force, um, which is this um, upward slope here. So this is DNA alone. When we added HP1, um, we saw that we um, sometimes had these rupture events. So where parts of the puncta would um, actually dissociate and we'd lose a little bit of extension. Um, but we never lost full extension and we typically sequestered um, a reasonable amount of DNA. So in this case, it was about a micron of DNA or around um, three kilobases of DNA within a puncta. Um, and after we pulled this bead out once, we could relax it back and pull it again and repeat the process kind of over and over. And every time we pulled, we saw that we sequestered more and more DNA within these puncta. And so we um, were able to measure this and seemed to be actually sequestering between one, um, one and five microns, which is um, on the range of three to 10 kilobases. Um, so we're starting to kind of reach what a heterochromatic domain, um, a small heterochromatic domain in, in mammalian cells would actually look like. We're um, sequestering quite a bit of DNA in there. And so to give you an idea of what 40 picanins means, um, nucleosome, so a histone and octomer core wrapped around 147 base pairs of DNA, is disrupted around 20 to 30 picanutons of force. Um, our structures are stable up to 40 picanutons. We're not able to disrupt them at all. And disruption in this case means that they, the, the, the histone proteins will disassociate from the DNA and flow into solution. RNA polymerase, the very motor that um, heterochromatin is about to stall, um, also stall that 20 picanutons of force. Um, so the idea is that if RNA polymerase is chugging along and trying to um, transcribe this region, if it runs into a heterochromatic puncta, um, it's not gonna be able to pull the DNA out of the structure. Um, and it'll be interesting to see um, if that ends up being the case, hopefully in future studies. And so um, the two assays I viewed, this DNA curtains and the the trap, um, gave us an idea that H-chromobinding actually is really sufficient to stably condense DNA in vitro. 
Um, but we still wanted to ask the question of whether or not it was dynamic in vitro. Was what we were seeing um, a little bit of an artificial system or are we seeing similar dynamic HP1 binding that we see in, um, in the cells? And so to do this, I'm gonna to switch to the um, droplet experiments. Um, and so HP1 forms these um, two-phase solutions when you add DNA. So HP1 just by itself, no DNA added, is miscible in solution, you get a clear test tube. Um, but the second you add DNA, you see the spontaneous demixing into a two-phase solution. And this has to do a lot with um, multivalent weak interactions between HP1 alpha and DNA. And these interactions um, are favored, so cell-self interactions are favored over interactions with the solvent. So you end up getting, getting these spherical drops um, that are trying to minimize any sort of surface area that has to be exposed to the solvent. And so we wanted to test what HP1 binding looked like. We wanted to do a similar fraction experiment in our in vitro system. That's what people had done in cells. Um, and so I collaborated with David Brown, a postdoc in Bo Huang's lab. Um, and we're using different lengths of DNA. Um, something interesting that I don't have too much time to tell you about today is that as you go up and up in DNA length, you actually start to get weirder and weirder morphologies because the droplets are struggling to coalesce. And this has to do with the viscosity of the DNA. So as you increase the length of the polymer, um, the viscosity or a fluid's resistance to deformation um, also gets higher and higher. And so it's harder to actually um, coalesce and organize these spheres when you have um, a really viscous mixture and all this DNA in there. And so you start to see these morphology, morphologies like here, um, where the droplets are fusing, but they're not necessarily finding, um, the, minimizing the surface area and getting that surface tension minimized. So um, regardless of the DNA length, we fracked a line through the center of the drop and looked at the recovery. Um, and so you can see this line here. And we saw that within a matter of seconds, um, we saw full recovery of the HP1 protein. This is HP1 alpha labeled here. And it didn't seem to matter what the DNA length was. This is three kilobases, eight kilobases, 50 kilobases. Regardless of the length, HP1 was able to really rapidly recover um, after this photo bleaching event. And you see this um, here with the time versus fluorescence intensity, you get rapid recovery. Um, and we got a T1 half in a matter of seconds, which is really reminiscent of these in vivo experiments that I had told you about. And so um, I'm gonna tell you about an experiment and first do a quick control. Um, and we want to test, um, we see dynamic HP1 binding in our FRAP, but we wanted to see if in the system we can actually stably condense DNA as well. And so to do this, I'm going to take um, droplets that are green, and I'm going to label H1 alpha with 488, and then add in um, 3KD DNA. And I'm going to let these um, droplets settle to the bottom of the well, and then flow in or add in um, magenta drops. Um, and so these are made with H1 alpha with 565. And because we saw this rapid recovery with flat frat, we expected that we would also see really rapid mixing of the HP1. Um, we know HP1 is coming in and out of the drops really quickly, so it should be able to equilibrate and get both green and magenta in the drops um, quickly as well. And so this video I'm gonna show you starts with um, the green drops at the bottom of the well, and I'm gonna add in the magenta drops. Let's see, maybe I will. Okay, here we go. And before you see any drops settle to the bottom of the well, you're actually getting enrichment of the magenta protein from solution into the pre-existing green drops. Um, and then as we're about to see some drops come from, that I added in, come to the bottom of the well. And by the time these magenta drops get down, they's all, they have also incorporated the green. So similar to what we saw with the FRAP, we're seeing really rapid mixing and recovery of the protein. And this is just an endpoint of this showing um, 48, 565 and overlay. Um, we next, and this is uh, the, the, not the control, but the fun experiment, uh, we wanted to see what happened when we did this with DNA. Um, so we had three kilobase DNA um, that was labeled with 48, so no H1 labeling this time, just the DNA labeled. Um, and then we're going to add in these magenta drops. And the hypothesis was that potentially we would actually not see the same mixing that we had seen with the HP1. And so this is starting a little bit later in the experiment, but you can see magenta and green drops. And that turned out to be exactly what we saw. So we actually got these stable domains um, where you'd have part magenta drop, part green drop. 
and they wouldn't mix over the time course of our experiment. Um, and this is a, about a 30 second video that is um, sped up. It's that it was actually an hour of imaging. Um, so these these droplets were stable over about an hour, and you'd get these these separate separate DNA domains that were also stable. Um, so this is just a snapshot. So you have the green part of the drop, magenta part of the drop, and the overlay. Um, and you get these two, this green domain, the magenta domain, and they're not mixing. So despite the fact that the protein is really rapidly moving in and out of the droplet, um, it's able to condense this DNA stably. And it doesn't quite matter which protein is doing it as long as there's a bulk effect of enough HP1 molecules binding and condensing the DNA at any one time, um, you're able to get this um, really stable DNA condensation, both in the droplets and um, in our DNA curtains and optical trap experiments. Um, and I'll, I'll speed through this because I know I'm going a little late. Um, but one question we had was um, when you how if you have a structure that's a stable, obviously in cells you need to disassemble structures like this. Heterochromatin can't be permanent. Every time you go through mitosis, you're gonna need to disassemble the heterochromatin and replicate the genome. So there has to be some sort of regulation going on here. Um, and to, to kind of get at this, I used one of the paralogs I told you about at the beginning. Um, HP1 beta is um, uh, another paralog of HP1, and it's not quite as canonical as alpha. Alpha um, protein is associated with heterochromatin, compacts DNA, and forms droplets. Um, and this is compared to HP1 beta, which uh, does not compact DNA and does not form droplets. And there are, in vivo, they've been shown to um, heterodimerize. So we thought there might be some sort of regulation there. Um, and so in this experiment, I have HP1 alpha with 565, and um, DNA has been added to form these drops. Um, I'm going to add an H1 beta, just the protein, um, with a fluorescent tag as well, H1 beta 48, and see what happens to the drops. And the H1 beta starts to incorporate, and then really rapidly disassembles the drop. So within a matter of seconds, these drops that are, can form these stable DNA domains that last in a matter of hours are able to be completely disassembled. And so I'm gonna summarize everything I've told you. Um, we're able to actually get these separated DNA domains in our droplets. Um, so we have a domain here and a domain here. And the HP1 is really dynamically going in and out. Um, there's this rapid HP1 exchange that is able to facilitate still this um, static DNA domains. Um, these, these domains are resistant to high amount of force. Um, they, they are resistant to about 40 picanins of force by our um, optical trap experiments, which is twice as much as that needed to stall um, a lot of DNA motors. And they can also be rapidly just dis dissolved. Um, because the, the protein is so dynamic, you're able to really quickly, with any sort of competitor, get in and dissolve the whole domain. And with that, I'm going to thank my labs. Um, I've been really lucky to have the Neurilacar lab um, and a lot of experts in heterochromatin, um, Serena and Emily, Serena here, Emily here, um, in the Reading lab, Lucy Brennan in particular, um, who helped me with this optical trap experiment. And then as well, um, Stefan Grill's lab and Bo Huang's lab um, and MBL and funding. Um, thank you. Excellent talk, thank you so much. Um, so we're getting some questions um, already. And um, the first one we have is, oh, and well, hang on, I need to scroll up. <laughs> so I'm going to um, first ask or allow um, Felix Muller Planets to talk. He has raised his hand, we'll do that. Um, and so while we're, we, oh, a lot of people are raising their hands. So we'll go ahead and do those first. And then the written questions, if you want to raise your hand, go ahead and do that. So, all right, so Felix, you should be unmuted. So you can go ahead and ask. Okay, hi. I'm, I'm not sure if you can see me, but I switched on my, my camera too, but never... Oh, yeah. Mind. We don't have cameras until you're oh, promoted to panelist, so you can hang around for the coffee chat for that if you want. Okay, <laughs> never, never mind. So, fantastic talk. Very nice. So, how do you how do you interpret the um, uh, your results that uh, the, the green and the red DNA don't rapidly mix? Um, so, do you still think that's a fluid, or is that a gel already, or how do you... What kind of phase is that? Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's a great question. And let's see, I would say potentially somewhere in between. Um, so the protein seems to really be acting 
like a liquid. Um, so it's rapidly coming in and out. But the viscosity of the DNA is not, an, it's, it's too viscous for, for the protein to actually be able to overcome the viscosity of the DNA and lead to those um, spherical drops that you get with the liquid. Um, so it's kind of a competition between the surface tension that the protein is providing and the viscosity that the DNA is kind of fighting against that, that surface tension with. Um, so these, these short pieces of DNA are definitely pretty liquid. As you go on, up and up, they struggle to fuse and the coalescence times goes a lot up. Um, but regardless, the protein is acting liquid. So it's not quite as typical as um, a classification as you might normally be able to say because there's, there's different... Um, components within the same drop that are seem to be acting differently. I believe that um, answers your question. Cool. Um, okay, so the other person who raised their hand put it back down. So um, I'm going to read a question from the Q&A text. Um, and really kind of I'm going to try to combine a couple questions. Um, so because they're a little bit similar. So the first person who asked the similar question is um, Deb Ranjan Banerjee. And the other one is Alexis Zukowski. And both of them are kind of getting to a similar idea where they're curious about how, um, you know, how given that there's not like a huge amount of naked DNA, I guess, in the cell, um, how, do, um, how do you think that the HP1 DNA binding and compaction occurs like on chromatin and Devon Jean Banerjee um, wanted to point out about how HP1 is known to recognize H3K9 trimethyl. Does that have, mark maybe have a role in this compaction? Um, yeah, all great questions, guys. So. <laughs> yeah, and all things we're thinking about really actively. Um, I think when I started this project, we there was so much to know just about the control, which was this DNA alone and the the untangling the control ended up being incredibly complicated. And, right. and DNA is a huge part of nucleosomes and um, is a really essential part of HPM binding. Um, so I think that this, this DNA component is gonna have a huge impact. Um, however, we are doing those experiments. So we're, we're doing it with 12 nucleosome arrays and looking at compaction with that. And um, especially when you get up to higher salts, that methylation mark does have a really um, interesting, interesting effect and, and does seem to be really important for H1 localization. Um, so I guess I'd say stay tuned and you're, yeah. you're both correct. But, oh, I guess in, in vivo, you're going to be in an environment as well that there's just DNA everywhere. You're, you have this huge concentration of DNA in the nucleus that's just jam-packed. Um, and so I think there's going to be quite, quite a lot of free DNA and linker DNA as well that's going to play a part in this process. Cool. Alexis also mentioned that she digs the psychedelic drop colors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted to add that. Um, okay, let me double check if anyone else has raised their hand. Okay, not yet. So I'm going to go keep doing the written questions. Um, Janet Young asks if HP1 beta alone can form drops. Yeah, it turns out it doesn't. Um, so I've tested at all these different DNA concentrations with beta, and we don't see anything. Um, I've also tested with the DNA curtains, and it doesn't have the compaction ability. But it has been seen in the past to um, people do these classic kind of spin down assays where you add chromatin and you spin it down and see what's in the supernatant versus in the pellet. And it does do that. Um, and when you put it on EM bread, also it does condense. So I think there might be some really interesting differences in kind of mechanisms of condensation. Um, yeah, I would kind of have a pet theory that beta is super good at compacting. And so with something like these mesoscale approaches, um, where we're looking, I mean, you're diffraction limited with a lot of this microscopy. So the really, really small condensation, we're not gonna be able to pick up, but it might just not be the right assay to be studying it. Cool. Well, okay, so um, I think we should probably move on to the next talk.